What's up, everybody? Just finished up a great podcast with Mr. Ryan Muckenhern and Ruben Allickson, all about shotgun shell selection. There's a ton out there. Every time you walk down the shotgun aisle at any sporting goods store, so many options to choose from. How do you know what's right for your particular gun? We also just talked a lot about shotguns in general, getting them fitted to you, patterning, a lot of really important things for probably the most versatile style of firearm out there today and maybe of all time. So check this one out. We want to hear what you guys think. Let us know if there's any other shotgun related topics you want to hear, but uh, this is a good one. So listen in. All right. What's up, everybody? Mark and I are joined by our friends, Ruben Alexson and Ryan Muckenhern across the table from us. In between us lies a 12 gauge shotgun that we grabbed out of the safe. I think it's actually uh, JMO's. So hope Minnesota you don't mind, JMO. He's not, uh, Jameson's not here right now, so he can't mind. No. Uh, you, may, you may also notice if you're watching on YouTube, a new background is, is now adorning the podcast studio. So, uh, yeah, definitely if you're listening right now, why don't you head on over and check that bad boy out? Pretty sweet. Came over from the shot show booth. I think I built that AR. Did you? I think so. Oh, yeah. I remember. It. Yeah, I remember seeing that one around. I think it's a, yeah. I think it's a little well, MP5 one. going on there. Yeah, that it is. Yoo-hoo. Everybody likes that. Mm-hmm. I think that's a SD5. It's cool as heck. You know that much. Not yeah, a shotgun. All you though. need to know is no. cool. Not a shotgun. Not though. a shotgun. No, it's not a shotgun. We talked many times about the was. fact that. A shotgun is pretty much the ultimate do-it-all firearm. It that is true. It pretty much literally can do anything. And the one thing about shotguns, at least I know that I've found, now Ruben and Ryan, you guys, and Mark, you too especially uh, as well, but all you guys have shot shotguns for a long time. I would say, particularly Ruben and Ryan, you guys are like shotgun fiends. You guys have been doing like you've done, done competitions with shotguns. You've you've collected shotguns. Slug hunting, Slug a lot of hunting. water fouling. Both yeah, you guys tons are of water fouling. All that stuff. And uh, the one thing about shotguns I know I've found is that the actual shotgun itself, in um, in its essence, seems so simple. But then when you go into the store and you're confronted by an aisle full of shell and do they call it ammo do they call it shells do they call it all of the above all of the above shells an aisle full of shells to choose from it's kind of complicated usually i just go with whatever's pictured on the box i was gonna say the the picture on the box will generally hopefully steer steer you in the right direction that's that's kind of what i've done but you know i mean big pictures guy there's there's numbers and then there's fractions and then there's mm-hmm. you know leads and there's toxic non toxic steel, uh, then of course there's chokes which is probably even a whole another thing in and of itself altogether. But we wanted to talk about as you're in this giant aisle of shells, how you go about choosing the right one for your shotgun. Probably easiest to start with is that you need to make sure you're getting the right one for your shotgun. In this case, in front of us here is a 12 gauge, so you're probably going to want to make sure you're getting a 12 gauge shell. Um, but, you know, there's all different kinds. There's 410, 12, 16, 20, 28, 20, 28, 32. Okay. Pretty, pretty obscure. 10. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 10, big boys. Probably the most common, at least in my eyes, are 410. 20 and 12. Yeah. Probably, yeah. And can, then can you go over the sizes real quick too? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because so, I think a 410 is a actually, caliber. Right. 410 yeah. bore. Yeah. So th- that one's a kind of an anomaly, uh but when we hear gauge where this comes from because a lot of people um you know, you hear 12 gauge. Well, what does 12 gauge mean? Right. If you were to take lead balls, <clears throat> the diameter of the barrel and uh put them in the bore barrel, whatever you want to call it, the number of balls required to a count or amount to a pound is your gauge. So if you have a 10 gauge barrel, it takes 10 of those lead balls to make one pound. Round. Perfectly round. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, If you have a 12, it takes 12. If you have a 28, it takes 28. If you have a 32, it takes 32, so on and so forth. So that's why the bigger number means that the bore is smaller. Larger. Larger. No. So 10 gauge has a larger bore than a 12 gauge. Exactly. 
12 is a bigger number than 10. So oh, it has I'm a smaller tracking. board. Yes. So, you know, yeah. Right. Because it would take more of the smaller balls, in this case, lead balls. Yes. Because they're smaller. Yes. Right. Yes. So it would take more of them, thus you get a larger number. Yes. 12, 20, 32, whatever. But then your board is getting smaller. Yes. Got it. Yeah. So I think a 410 is like a 54 gauge. I, I, someone told me one time, I forgot. Nobody calls it a gauge. It's a 410. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Within that, then you also have, I would say, what's what's the natural progression when you guys are looking for shells? Maybe you guys probably at this point in time, you just already know what you're looking for, so you just go out and buy it. But let's say somebody's just starting to try and figure out what shell they need to be using. Do you go to length next? Because there's, you know, like 12 gauge, you got three inch, three and a half, well, two and a half, I think, two and three quarters. Yeah. So you want to uh, maybe think about your, your like quarry or target. So if we're going to go. Yeah. Application. Yeah. Big, okay. big time. So, excuse me. If we're going to hunt ducks, um, you know, two and three quarter, three inch, three and a half inch would be the most, well, those are the 12 gauge lengths. But, um, you know, you're going to select based on shot size, uh, shot requirement, whether it's going to be toxic or non-toxic. If it's going to be waterfowl, it's going to be non-toxic. Um, and most popularly, you're going to find those probably around a three inch. But what length to use or what shot size to use is somewhat personal, um, and then, you know, your gun is going to dictate what works the best. I think a lot of folks go buy a shotgun off the wall and then go buy shotgun ammo, um, from that retailer and then just take it a field and start cracking holes in the sky and eventually connect with ducks and geese and things like this. But it is important in my opinion, anyway, to take your gun and pattern it with a given load. And yeah. you may find that some loads in, in a given gun pattern wonderfully and others are absolute garbage. Um, once you know where your gun patterns or what your gun likes, um, it makes that decision much easier. I, f- I feel like I hear people talk about patterning, patterning your shotgun, you know, primarily with turkey hunting. Yeah, yep. But it sounds like it's important for really anything oh, you're yeah. going to be doing. So Ruben and I, uh, and Ruben still does, uh, I used to shoot quite a bit of three gun. And <clears throat> it became very obvious to us early in the game that your point of impact was slugs buckshot and birdshot are, are probably going to be different. Mm-hmm. And it, be, it was very important to start patterning your gun and figuring out where it goes with what chokes, especially when the targets started getting pretty fun. Mm-hmm. You know, we started getting no-shoot shotgun targets, which are really interesting. Like if you hit one pellet on that target, that's a no-shoot and you're penalized for it. Gotcha. So it's super important to know where your pattern is. I mean, is. it may be kind of nearby one that you are yeah, supposed to shoot. really close. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it, it was important to pattern your gun. And I, I you know, I came from a competitive clays background before I got into multi-gun. Um, so knowing where my shotgun pattern was of the utmost importance, because mm-hmm. otherwise I'm not going to hit clay pigeons with any degree of reliability. Um, so, yeah, I think it's important to pattern, um, you know, for more than just turkeys. If you're yep. a upland hunter, if you're a waterfowler, it's, it's immensely important. How does it work when you're patterning your shotgun? What what are you doing? What are you looking for? How does that actually change the way? I mean, I got it. So I don't shoot a lot of shotgun. I, if that hasn't been obvious enough already in only like seven minutes of podcasting here. But <laughs> I, like I pull up the bead, put the bead on the thing and shoot, right? Yeah. Are you guys doing something different after you pattern? You should probably talk about patterning first, but I'm just getting super excited now. Um. Yeah. So I hang a patterning board, uh, which is usually like a 36 by 36 piece of paper you can go bigger too if you want um a 30 inch circle yeah and i think the number is probably somewhat arbitrary too you could do a smaller circle if you wanted a 30 inch circle with a center dot and beat on that center dot pull the trigger i'm looking for a few things where is the majority of my pattern relative to that center dot um so am i on it am i above it am i below it um and then also what does my pattern look like um, so, you know, ideal pattern is, is a nice, tight, dense ball of shot. Uh, Circular. Yeah, right. We don't want an oblong, spaghetti noodle shaped, figure eight. That, that's all bad news. Um, mm. You know, it, you think about um, like the Elmer Fudd, you know, shoots a, a shotgun load at a, a wooden sign or something. You get perfect dispersion of pellet holes. That's what we're after. Um, and a lot of times it's not necessarily going to happen on the first go. You might find your gun shoots high, low, left, right. Um, once you determine though, anyways, from your point of aim, where your pattern is, uh, it's a great way to 
start figuring out how to hit targets or at least come up with a, a, a correction when you're in the field or correct something on your gun. If, okay. If you're if you're getting maybe like an undesirable pattern, mm-hmm. would you suggest trying a different load then? Trying a different load or trying a different choke. Okay. Um, so let's talk about turkeys specifically. I think um, a lot of people buy three and a half inch twelve gauge, the big old two ounce Whompers. Oh yeah. And they go buy extra, extra, extra full uh, chokes. And um, when you say like full chokes, means that it's like condensing it down a little yeah, bit, right? Yeah. Tightest it's constriction. Poor constriction gets yeah. tighter. Okay. And then they go take it to the turkey woods. And most of the time it works out pretty good. You know, if you're calling turkeys in, you get a bird coming 10, 20 yards and you could probably kill them with a cylinder bore. But if you take it to a patterning board, um, especially if you're running those really long shot columns, like a three and a half inch shell would have, and then a very, very tight constriction, you get a lot of uh, figure eight shaped patterns or mm. uh, oval patterns that have a big hole in the middle. It's called a blown pattern, um, which is exactly the opposite of what we want with the spirit of that choke tube. Yeah, so like when you're out turkey hunting, you want kind of a tighter, oh, yeah. denser group because... Yep. And is that is that because just the nature of turkeys? Like, one, they're just... You want it right on the head? Yep. Yes, okay. that, that blown pattern seems like you are uh, basically uh, omitting the yeah. part of the turkey you're trying to hit. Correct. It's... <laughs> chokes always weird me out because... So, you know, it seems like you're making the bore of the barrel smaller. Slightly. And how that doesn't wind up being similar to, like, people talk about barrel obstructions, you know, yeah. and they obviously that can have catastrophic effects. Now, granted, it's not literally plugging. Right. But it's kind of weird to me. Like, shot- it seems, it's uncomfortable for me to think about choking something like down, even though right. I've shot guns that have been and I'm still here to tell it. About Shotguns it. work on much lower pressures than say a rifle does. Uh, and then the choke is somewhat uh, misleading because I think a lot of people think that we're like squeezing the shot. Yeah. And if you if you over choke, you can get to that point where you're actually starting to impede on the shot column itself with the wad. Um, but keep in mind, your shot's not going to be in front of your wad as it's traveling down the barrel. Your shot's going to be encapsulated in your wad as it goes down the barrel. Oh. And then we hit... Um, you know, the forcing cone. So we start this constriction actually quite a ways back in the barrel. Uh, and it's a very gradual taper. Um, hmm. And then we hit the choke point. And at that point, what we're actually doing is, or I guess what we should be doing is slowing the wad. We're trying to separate the wad from the shot column that keeps our pattern tight. When the pattern really starts to open, as the shot column leaves the barrel and the wad, the wad begins to open and push through that shot column. Okay. And it, it, it actually starts to physically spread it. If you can strip the wad away from a shot column, you will end up with a perfect ball of shot coming out at the end of your barrel. And that's how you end up with a tight pattern. Hmm. Um, one of the best choke tubes on the market for doing this is from a company called Pattern Master. Um, and they're a very, very popular waterfall choke. Um, I run them for turkeys on one of my guns. They, they actually don't choke very tight. If you were to uh, put a caliper on them and measure their diameter, they actually choke somewhere around a mod. Uh, maybe a little bit tighter than a mod, but not tight by tight standards. They do have, however, five little fingers that go into the choke. They look like little um, knobs. And what they do is they're... they're, Kind of a stud. Yeah. Hmm. All they do is they just retard the wad very briefly, like almost an instantaneous stop of the wad um, as it's going down the barrel and strips the the wad from the shot column. The shot column can leave the bore on you know, unmolested by the, the wad. It won't blow it out. And so you end up with this nice ball of shot coming out with no wad to push through it and blow it open. Very interesting, interesting concept. Yeah. And, yeah. and kind of backwards when you really look at like how a conventional choke tube would work. Um, it's a, you know, they call it a wad stopper um, design. Another thing that happened in the last 10 years was uh, Federal kind of developed a, a wad for their flight control line of products. So, like, if you've ever heard of Black Cloud or Flight Control Buckshot, um, they have a wad that does the same thing. These, I guess, what would be called, like, an aileron or something that comes out. Basically, a fin pops out and slows the wad down after it comes out. Um, And you can use the cheapest choke that comes with your shotgun and still accomplish, um, like, the same... Mm -hmm. Whoa. The same kind of result in terms of your pattern. And one thing that... I think it goes back to selecting your shot. Mm-hmm. Is you could buy this 
seventy-five dollar pattern master choke or more, yeah, seventy-five to a hundred and a quarter, and put it in the shotgun, and then go buy thirty-dollar box of uh, Black Cloud with their flight control wad, mm-hmm. and you get terrible results because the, that choke doesn't allow the wad to function as. So it's like it's a yeah. it's an either or thing. So when you're thinking about spending money on shot shells, you could go spend the most money on the 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 choke and then the most money on your shot and it doesn't work as it should because you're kind One, of negating. Yeah. So it's like you need to know when you're selecting your shot. Um, one of uh, a good friend of mine out in Western Minnesota runs uh, probably like a 30 year old 870 Express mm-hmm. Magnum three and a half. He shoots the Federal Blue Box two and three quarter inch with a pattern master choke and it performs. I mean, he, he shoots more birds than any of us and makes some of the most incredible shots, but it's because he's got the right setup and he has it patterned and he knows what it can do. Right. But if you would then go and take, he shoots $10 a box shot shells. And if he would go and spend three times that and buy a pattern math or buy um, the flight control black cloud, it wouldn't work nearly as good. But since he has that combination between his choke and the shells that he's using picked out and properly selected and patterned, it works great. No, that's a really good point because, like you said, you've got a you know that wad and then that choke essentially, uh, essentially operating under kind of different principles mm-hmm. of but with the same outcome. But with the same outcome, but together they don't work. They aren't going to work. Right. And, and you know, just off the street, I'd go. Oh, I hear a lot about that one. That's the best. And I hear a lot about that one, and I really like that one. Um, let's put them together, and you're getting a negative result. Yeah. That, that, that's really yeah. good to point out. Yeah. Multiplication maybe isn't <laughs> isn't the case here. Um, when you're talking about patterning, you know, you were mentioning, so let's say you're not getting a desirable pattern. You go to maybe to changing either the choke or the shells that you're using, maybe both. Who knows? Let's say you start getting a more desirable pattern, which you know you're mentioning is more of a dense circle shape. Um, dense being that there aren't very many open pockets within yep. the pattern, right? Yeah, exactly. you want a very consistent spread, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. if your pattern is a 12 inch pattern at 10 yards, you don't want a four inch circle in the middle and then a bunch of open spots with scattered pellets. You want yeah. No, you don't want flyers, right? You don't. Mm-hmm. You want your pattern to be nice and consistent. Yeah. And to a point, it will never be perfect. But when we're looking at what our pattern is, and I've got a book, I really should have brought it now that I think of it. But I've got a book with each of my shotguns, and then their patterns at different distances, so that when we're at matches, I can look at okay, there's a target at this distance, and there's a no shoot target next to it. What choke should I run if I also need to knock down a target at much closer distance? with a great amount of speed. So like my mm-hmm. pattern would be very small. Well, and then would you ever like, let's say you had one of those no, no shoot targets that was adjacent. I mean, are you trying to use like the fringe of your pattern at yeah. times then? Yes, okay. absolutely. Hmm. Interesting. Now let's say one thing is you're mentioning it might be up, down, left, right. So maybe you finally do get a good pattern, but you notice that it's not right on where you're putting your bead. So I'm looking at a gun like this right in front of us. This is a 870 and it's got, it's got a bead sight on the front. Can you do anything to this thing to make it to like sight it in, so to speak? Yep. What What would you actually do? It um, doesn't look that adjustable. So, some of it is going to be uh, actually just how you hold the gun and okay. how, you're, how you're sighting down it. So, adding a mid rib bead, so as it would be literally termed mid rib, okay. can help with alignment. Um, now, on this particular 870, we don't have an option, but on some other guns, we would. Uh, shimming the stock here, on, on like, let's just take when Mark shoots a Benelli M2, for example. Um, his Benelli comes with a variety of shims that control the cast and the pitch um, of the stock. Oh, so that's can, for yep. elevation? Or can, no, that's windage-wise? Yep. yep. Uh, left, right, up, down. Oh, okay. Um, and so the, the shims typically have, like... A combination of two shims can cast it or pitch it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And so you can actually modify how you hold the gun and how that presentation is. Now there there comes a mm-hmm. point though where you'll have a point error in the barrel, and and like it it's uncorrectable by adding a mid rib bead or or adjusting your uh, uh, you know your pitch your cast your camber that kind of thing on the stock. Um, and, and then there's some other solutions out there. Um, 
you know, where we're actually going to start modifying, say, the barrel ring that's soldered to the barrel that holds on to the magazine tube. Um, you can actually bend the barrel for a long time in multi-gun. Uh, it's, it's lot, like, you think I'm joking. Um, the, the observation was that the very popular automatic shotgun at the time had a very strange point of impact <clears throat> with slugs and, and shot. And the correction to this was to wrap it in a towel and beat it against a tree and bend the barrel until you had the desired result. And you think I'm joking, but this was a service. Sounds very scientific. This was a service that was offered by some of the bigger um, performance gunsmithing. Pay me X, I'll beat your gun against the tree. And it worked though, right? So we're actually physically bending the barrel to... Yeah, I mean, yeah, if it works, it works. That's so shotgun though, you know? Yeah. It's it's, so shotgun to fix it by beating it on a tree. There's there's better (laughs) ways to do it, right? Um, it's, 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 it's borderline AK esque. Yes. And that's a pretty severe example, right? <laughs> so if, if we had, yes. a, if we had a run out, like on this particular firearm, if we had a run out between our magazine tube, um, which is under the slide action there and, um, the barrel, if they weren't perfectly parallel with each other on, on either axes, mm-hmm. um, you could have a, a, an issue there where it's actually influencing the barrel and how it's pointing. Um, so there's a correction that could be made within the ring uh, that holds it on there, or we can actually correct it at the receiver end. Um, it's starting to get costly at that point. And we're usually like, are we hunting something um, or like a problem and, and really trying to make a micro correction that's not going to result in a huge impact down range? Yeah. Is there, is there... When in the end, you could just maybe hold slightly correct. to the right. And that brings something. up another point on shotgun selection, too. It's a lot like we talk with rifles, where some of the very high production models, the fit, finish, the quality control is not the same as it might be on something where, like, for example, we don't see really any Tikas that are misaligned, right? When we have people come in and mount scopes or when we're out in the field mounting scopes. Mm. Um, and typically, I mean, it's a little higher dollar rifle, but... Um, we have seen rifles that have been uh, more of a, like a mass production thing be off by, I had one that was off at about seven feet at a hundred yards. So the fit and the finish, and then really the quality control coming out of the manufacturer, a shotgun is, is one of those things where you say it's like, it's a shotgun it shoots a ball of shot. How precise does it need to be? Those are some of the things you get when you spend a little bit more money. Yeah, you never really realize how precise, precise it needs to be until yeah. you shoot and you miss with one. And, then you're well, really- and that kind of fit thing, too, that Ryan was talking about a little bit, it's like kind of like it explains why there is a little bit of uh, – there is a little bit to it when you say – you're talking to somebody and they're like, oh, I can hit really good with that one. And it's like maybe it's a cheaper gun. And mm-hmm. you're like, man, I've always shot lights out with that thing. And it might just be because that particular gun fits them better. It, it's not any better. It's not any worse. It's just there was just somebody flipped a coin at one point in time, and that stock was set right for them. Well, and that's what I mean. That's what you hear a lot. Is like, oh, shotgun fit, shotgun fit, shotgun fit, right? Yeah. But like, admittedly, for me, I've primarily run two shotguns in my life. Uh, both auto loaders. One's a Browning A five hundred G. The other's that Benelli M two. Um, both I've done, even though my Benelli came with shims. I assume I'm a pretty average build guy. I guess I made the assumption that the way it came out of the box is kind of the the, the most a, most averagest, and I haven't <laughs> made an adjustment uh, to it. It shoots okay, but and I haven't shot that Browning in a while. But I feel like I shoot that gun much better. Yeah, and it could could be fit, like Ruben said, fits a huge. But how do you know? So how would you know? And maybe this is is it just trial and error? Um, is it going and and going with somebody who's a professional or? Or, you know, a shotgun Both. coach or something Both. like that. Yeah, because so Ruben can shoot a low rib gun, like a Beretta 391. I cannot shoot a low rib gun to okay. the same degree of uh, success. My first shotgun was a, a 390 uh, and moved on to a 391. But, I mean, it, it's it's how it fits. Right. And, and like, it's probably part of, like, how I learned to, to shoot a shotgun, too. But right. um, the, when I guess when... Both Ryan and I were coming up in, in shotgun shooting. I shot a lot of trap. Um, he shot a lot of skeet, a lot of sporting clays, probably a lot of trap too. Um, you're around these people that are constantly talking about like, well, did you get this fit? How does it work? Like mm-hmm. what shells are you using? And so like the shotgun kind of subculture within the shooting sports, whether it be shotgun games, clay games, or mm-hmm. three-gun action shooting stuff, um, 
you're you're around this group of people that constantly is they're conscious of these differences in mm-hmm. in guns and in shot shells and in chokes and in you know. Would you like you guys? You know, a lot of shotgun experience. Like, and I'm thinking primarily from like um, from uh, from a hunting aspect. So let's say we were uh, shooting a round of sporting clays. So you know, kind of simulating those hunt scenarios, and maybe you could tell oh, I was uh, missing birds, or maybe you know, chipping. Whatever, would you be able to tell? Be like, oh, Mark, it's because you need to shim the comb this way or that way. Um, or? Yeah, uh, you can you can glean a lot of information uh, on how a person is shooting, maybe a particular target. Um, not every target, because every target presentation is going to be different. But uh, on a previous podcast, you guys had Ruben, and you were talking about cross-eyed dominance, mm-hmm. um, and uh, one of the gentlemen who uh, was like a big influence in my sporting clays career, uh, identified my cross-eye dominance and he noticed it when I was shooting left to right and right to left crossers. Uh, and, and specifically the left to rights. Um, my left eye was picking them up. Um, this didn't have a ton to do with shock fit per se, but how I was using the gun blocked off my left eye. I picked it up with my right, my left to right crossers went up exponentially. So you could, yeah, you could, if you watched a particular shooter enough times on a particular target presentation, you could derive maybe a fit issue. I think another thing that comes up quite a bit too is shooting trap. Yeah. Um, if you see somebody missing high a lot, yeah. missing low a lot, yeah. you can on the straightaway say, birds. Yeah, on the straightaway yeah. birds, it's pretty easy to tell. Like, okay. okay, you don't have your cheek down, or you have your cheek off. You know, like yeah. you're too you're pressing too hard on the gun, or you're you're up off the gun, mm-hmm. and like you'll shoot right over a bird or you'll shoot right under a bird. Uh, mm. And we can pretty quickly determine that on a straightaway bird. Yeah. But. I find personally with my Benelli M2, which I, I really like, but like if I, when I'm turkey hunting and I bear down on that gun and just draw a really strong bead on a bird and squeeze it off, I mean, it's deadly. And maybe it's just because I'm not as good a wing shot, right? But like like I said, I feel like with the A five hundred, I'm a better wing shot than I am with that Benelli. And maybe it's again, like you said, they're dramatically different shotgun configurations. Oh, yeah. I found I'm making I'm making this about me because I'm trying to solve me problems no, right I, now. In looking at the two guns, <laughs> like they're different rib configurations. That, that's just what I was gonna say. Yeah. Uh, so your Benelli is yeah. a high rib. So like this is a this is a high rib. The rib steps up and then goes forward. Your A five hundred is yeah. a flat rib. Mm-hmm. Um, so you talk about having to bear down on your Benelli. You're treating it much like you would your A500, in which your rib is much f- lower and flatter. Um, so, yeah, so when you look down a raised rib, like yeah. your M2 mm-hmm. came out of the box, it's a raised rib. Right. Um, my first my first M1, which was an HK gun. Low rib. Low rib. So the only thing That's I should be one, seeing. Yeah, yeah, so the only thing I should be seeing is the bead. Right. Okay. On a raised rib gun, so going then to an M2 from that, or even a later M1 that I got, um, you're seeing this ramp and then the bead. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's it's completely different what yeah. you're looking for in your sight picture. So if you're shooting two different guns with one with a raised rib and one with a, uh, a straight, you're going to probably have issues. And, I, and Well, that's uh, good for a person to know. If they're going to have multiple shotguns, maybe m- maintain consistency with that rib configuration then? Absolutely. Okay. So when I shoot low rib guns, like Ruben's original M1 or a, a 390 or 391, I, I I can tell immediately that it's a low rib gun. Um, I'm shooting below birds. I'm shooting behind birds. It's, it's a presentation thing uh, every time. It's the same thing. I switch to a high rib gun so long as the stock configuration is similar to what I run on either my field guns or my uh, competition guns, and I'm, I'm back on to proper placement but Um, the one thing i've always noticed not to interrupt but one thing i've always noticed about shooting like duck hunting and you've got a group of three or four birds coming in you might have to shoot one and transition to another Mm -hmm. bird i've noticed that a flat rib gun for me is i don't like shooting a flat like a straight rib gun um when i'm gonna you know if i'm goose hunting or duck hunting when i've got multiple shots because it's like after recoil, if your your bead dips down, mm-hmm. you have no no reference. So I don't know where my bead is at. So I shoot low on a lot of birds after my first shot. Okay. With a raised rib gun, typically 
you don't really see that disappear on you. So, I mean, my I've transitioned to a to a, a Beretta with a raised rib for for bird hunting. Um, okay, but I still run the three ninety for pheasant hunting because there's a lot of times where it's just one bird getting up. Okay, and like it's a lighter gun, it's softer shooting, but like for when I really started to notice those second, third shot misses, especially with limited choke tube, you know, or limited mag tube capacity. Um, I'm more effective with a raised rib gun if okay. I've got multiple targets. And that is the same that I shoot for competition, is, which is always multiple targets. Gotcha. Wow. So there's more Dude. to shot shells than just <laughs> yeah, shot shells. Just it's thinking thinking also about How do we bring guns? this back to shot shells? I've got a couple things. I Yeah. Well, I, Okay, go for it. Well, I was going to say, we're talking about, you know, the, I guess, you know, the bore diameter. Um, we've got different shot sizes, right? And then you guys were also talking about, uh, you know, non-toxic versus toxic shot, which I'm assuming is just the difference between a, a steel or, or not, not a steel, but a, a lead versus... Uh, a bimetal alloy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Going, can you guys go into, like, the shot size, I think it is, when people say, like, a number or something. People right. would be like 12 gauge, 3 inch, number blank. Very confusing because it's <laughs> it, it is. There's uh English and standard. Oh, great. And then it's numbers and letters. And then half sizes. Um Why? so the larger oh, so many. the larger the number, <laughs> the smaller the shot. Why do that and it's, Shotguns. And then when oh, we get sure. to... Oh, sure. We'll just make backwards. Because it's old. Yeah. It's cause old and British. And then we got to get into... It's elegant. We got to get into drams. <laughs> yeah, we drams. touched on dram yet. And that's a whole nother thing. So that's... Drams a, is just brass. Uh, it's a volumetric drams, measurement conversion drunk. to weight. I get this. Like, high brass isn't really brass. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's usually steel. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things going on here. Yeah. <laughs> so... Mark so, just about threw in the headset. So shot sizes... Yeah, um, let's start there. So it gets a little cloudy because we get into um, non-toxic and then we treat shot sizes differently. And when I say non-toxic, I'm not talking steel. I'm talking bimetal alloy. Um, Tungsten, so, bismuth. Yeah. Yeah. The okay. good, The good, good. The good. Oh, yeah. Um, with uh, shot sizes, like, okay, we're just going to... Remember the Minnesota DNR used to put out the waterfowl manual for the state. And they had pictures of uh, the different ducks. Yeah. And then what shot size you should use for them. Yeah. So this is how I see it. It was great. They had like a picture of a snow goose, which at the time we didn't have snow geese in Minnesota. Yep. Use shot size two or larger, two to BBB. Um, so once you get above one, it goes into letters. It goes B, BB, BBB, T, double T. Is, there, is there a triple T? Uh, I don't think there's triple T. And then F. Mm. And then we go back to... Uh, Numbers, but only zeros. Ot, ot, yeah. double ot, uh, triple ot, four ot, four ot. Yeah, general reserved it's for your your buck, buck shots. Your buck shots, yeah, right. Or, uh, like, sandhill low. <laughs> yeah. yeah, is buckshot where you you actually shoot like a deer with buckshot? Yeah, some states, yeah, some you states. Oh, that's how yeah. it got its name. Yeah. Okay. Now, up until not long ago, you could in Wisconsin. Yeah, like, dude. when we were growing up, you would go to Wisconsin. You know, and you would bring the buck. Use the buck shot. Look out! Okay, yeah. but all that right. Was so no, no for us. What? But so shot like size. Uh, predator hunting. I yeah. hear a lot of four buck. Four buck, yeah. Um, you get a lot of entry holes though. Yeah, I mean it, it's not four, good on pelts. Four buck. Four zeros. So four out buck. Often abbreviated to just four buck. Not a saver. Okay. Not a pelt saver. Not a pelt saver, but you want to shoot a running coyote. That's good in one. your pasture. Well, yeah. um, shot sizes. Uh, so looking at common shot sizes that we find, if you're going to shoot trap, a lot of times you shoot a seven and a half. So smaller. Smaller. Yep. Yeah, very fine. Talking about 800 pellets per shell. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, you know, you could also do double duty on a grouse or a woodcock or, well, not a woodcock because it's migratory bird. A uh, grouse. A doves. <clears throat> yep. Or a dove. Okay. No, not a dove either. Oh, cripes. No. Well, it depends on where you are. I guess you can shoot lead depending on. You can? Uh, at doves, depending on where you are. Yeah. Hmm. Not, maybe not on a only WPA, about but on a WPA. wildlife management yeah. area. And I guess that goes for woodcock then, too, yep. because they're not a duck. That's Can't right. shoot ducks with lead. Migratory. Um, and, and that's because, what's the lead? Th what's the So back in 88, they banned lead shot for waterfowl. For waterfowl. Okay, yeah. so you're not getting lead all over the place or something like the that? The thought was, um, you know, a loon eats a, 
lead pellet gets lead poisoning, dies. Okay. Um, some controversy surrounding Check that. out the NSSF survey uh, st- uh, project on the California condors. There's some very eye-opening results. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Um, the, so they came out with steel shot um, okay. at that point in time. Uh, back then, it was bad. Uh, very poor quality shot. Uh, you open up a shot shell, you look at it. Instead of it looking like a BB or a bearing, it looked like a booger that was very rusty um, and not good. So steel, steel? shot, yeah, yeah. Steel yeah. shot uh, enjoyed terrible success early. Okay. This is this is where the three and a half inch twelve gauge came from. So the only way to get a better, like a better ballistic performance out of that, was to lengthen the. Shot shell, increasing the number of pellets, increasing the hit probability, because the patterning just went to poop. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and Mossberg came out with the first three and a half inch 12 gauge. Uh, in, in any event, um, back on shot size, so the seven and a half, a fine shot. And that's what you get in lead. Uh, yeah, yeah. You can get seven and a half steel, but it's very anemic. So right. we'll, we'll speak in terms of lead. It doesn't lead. carry energy. Got it. Yeah. Um, and this has to do with pellet density. So mm-hmm. lead is denser than steel. So per cc, you, you get a, a heavier load. Um, yeah, okay. Lead. Makes sense. Um, moving up to like a five or a six shot. This would be commonly used for uh, pheasants or turkeys, um, even grouse, um, a chucker. You know, if you're in western landscapes and you get some longer shots or you're shooting through some heavier stuff. I've actually switched to heavier shot for grouse over the past couple of years. Um to get through denser foliage. What are you um, running for that then? Uh, number six. Remington two by fours. <laughs> Remember those? That's funny. Um, which we'll get to that too. Blend shot. Yeah. Um, so like a five, six, like upland birds. Um, move up to a two, three, four. That's a waterfowl load. We're going to switch to a steel probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we are for ducks for sure and geese. Uh, two, three, four would be large to small ducks, like everything from you know, teal to maybe even snow geese with twos. Uh, above twos, like one B, 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 triple B, B, T, that would be like large geese and swans. Mm-hmm. Um, when you get into blend shots, like Ruben said, the Remington two by four, it's a mix of twos and fours. Pretty revolutionary. Uh, it was a great idea. Uh, kind of flopped. The idea was that they would load the first portion of the shell with the smaller BBs and the top portion. They had another name for it. It was... Uh, Magnum Blend? No, that no. was uh, environmental. Heavy but shot. So the, the idea was that the bigger BBs would go and rip out, Fart. shoot them through brush or yeah. shoot them through. Oh, they would lead the way. Yeah. Interesting. And, or go so farther, the, yeah. depending on mm. if you... Yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and now, Blend... Technology is somewhat popular in some shot. Um, environmental, they make a heavy shot. They have a magnum blend that I believe is five, six, and seven uh, for turkeys. Okay. Uh, and yep. it's re- reportedly very effective. Now, I'm a number five guy when it comes to turkeys. Maybe I'll change my mind later. Um, but uh, that, that uh, bimetal blend, the non toxic stuff we're talking about. Uh, again, we talk about uh, shot density per cc, mm-hmm. and I can't remember what lead is. If lead's right around, is it eight or ten grams per sure. cc? Environmentals like heavy shots right around ten to thirteen, depending on what blend you get. So it's like as dense as lead or denser. And then there's some other new ones out there um, that are denser than that yet. Yeah. Federal's got a new one, TSS, which is a tungsten. Super alloy, and they've got some other stuff in there. Super shot, and it's mm-hmm. it's even denser than that. Like I think it's getting closer to fourteen to fifteen grams per cc. There's what, a, this, what this allows the shooter is you can now go smaller shot sizes, right? Carry more energy per pellet, more which, pellets, more pellets, and then um, so the smaller you go in a shot pellet, the better penetration you can get to a point until you're like shooting sand at something. Um, so you can now hunt turkeys with, like, nines. There's a guy that uh, is down in Tennessee that loaded me up a few boxes two years ago. Um, he has a, a company now, and I hate that I forgot the name of it, but it's 11s. Yeah. It's loaded with 11s, so it's 3-inch, 12-gauge, 11s. Uh, something like 1,200 or 1,300 BBs. 
And what's the shot? Oh what's the shot composition? What's it made of? It's you know? tungsten. It's tungsten. Yeah, okay. but but at like forty yards, my test pattern was like that. Absolutely That's amazing. That's like the size of a. That was basically like, a four what, inch circle. In, four inch. Yeah. Four to five inch circle at forty yards, and it's like a grapefruit. It on takes it. out the bigger. center of a piece of half inch plywood. Yeah. You want to kill a turkey? That's now, crazy to think about because you know when you when you see tur- like turkeys, they're so. They're tough. They are. And then you think about shooting little stuff at it like that, yeah. but I guess if it's all being concentrated in that small of a yeah. group, then it's all just... And another oof. thing, too, with uh, the, the smaller BBs, other than the fact that they're smaller and you can get more of them in the wad, they're also smaller and they fit tighter together, and as they travel, they don't interrupt each other as much. Okay. Hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. So well, what, one you know, thing that you can get from flyers and... Whether you're shooting seven and a halfs in a you know in a target load or whatever, you can get if when when the shot and usually the more you spend on shot shells, the better quality hull you get and the better quality wad you get. Those are two things that come okay as you spend a little bit more money on shot shells. But this forcing cone back here is where it goes from the chamber into that diameter of the bore. Mm-hmm. One thing that can happen in that forcing cone is a little bit of the shot can get squeezed as that wad squeezes initially down into that. Mm -hmm. And it can imagine pinching some of those BBs out and Mm -hmm. now they bounce down the bore. And so that's where you get that pattern. And then your majority, we'll call it 80% is in a nice circle. Then you get all these flyers. Okay. And so some companies like um, Briley down in uh, Texas, they make, uh, awesome chokes. They make awesome, awesome competition guns. But Briley will do a process, and they'll lengthen the forcing cones. A lot of gunsmiths will do this too, but those are just the guys that I work with primarily. But they'll length, lengthen that forcing cone from a few inches to about nine inches. So it's a much more gradual pattern uh, process as that shell ignites, the wad opens up, the crimp opens, and the shot is starting to move down the barrel. That forcing cone is now a much more gradual angle. So that's uh, lengthening the forcing cone. And then some companies will also do what's called back boring, which is opening the bore from 721 to 733 or 737 on a 12-gauge at yeah. least. So, And that's accomplishing the same thing? It's, it's creating less interaction where the wad has to squeeze down. Okay. Um, so the transition through... The chokes is smoother, and also the wad isn't being squeezed as much. So okay. typically it's... The same thing is happening, it's just less aggressive. There's probably as many guys that say it doesn't do anything as swear by it. Oh, interesting. It's one of those things, right? Okay. Hmm. So there's there's a huge group of guys that are like, no, it doesn't do nothing. That's just spending money. And then there's a group of guys that are like, no, I patterned my shotgun before and after, and it does. So I have four shotguns now that have both a length forcing cone and a back boring to 733 bore. And I can tell you that patterns went from kind of an 80% pattern and then a 20% in a, in a larger ring mm-hmm. to a very, very consistent okay. um, pattern throughout that outer circle. However... So you kind of doubled up there. You can still use cheap shot shells and get bad patterns. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to be the do-all, be-all, end-all treatment for your shotgun, but it okay. does accomplish a few things. You can buy expensive shot shells and have bad patterns, too. Yes. <laughs> and... So don't take for granted necessarily the price tag of your shot. And especially as we're getting closer to turkey season, too. And when I worked retail, I saw this. I had guys come into the shop all the time, and they would buy the most expensive turkey loads they can because we take for granted that it costs money, so it must be good. Has to say extreme on the box. Yep. Right. And With an X and no E. Yep. Right. Your gun will tell you whether or not it is a good loading. Right. It is not. We, we can't take for granted that because it's made out of a particular blend of alloys or <clears throat> is a particular length or a, a muzzle velocity or, or whatever that it's going to shoot really good. Um, it, it is very much so individual gun. And and by that, I mean like a, no two Benelli M2s are going to be the same. Yep. But a Benelli M2 is going to pattern probably different than a Remington 870, which is probably going to pattern different than a Mossberg hmm. 835. Gotcha. And gotcha. shotguns are also one of the firearms, I would say, left in the firearms world that are still very much hand-built. Yep. Um, barrels are typically either forged or or it's just a pipe that gets drilled out with a reamer on some World War II equipment. I mean, like, honestly, hmm. um, your ribs are 
bronze, uh, brazed on with like a bronze or brass solder. And those aren't permanently machined into the barrel. That's something really? that comes okay, on. Yeah. The barrel gets bent so that when this gets soldered on, this is keeping that barrel straight and tight too. So, I mean, there's, uh, as your barrel heats up, that thing starts to move too. I mean, that's, it's not a, it's a very, I guess there's a lot of human interaction building shotguns. Right. Right. Is there, would there be consistency among builders like Bob builds the X shotgun kind of consistently one way and I know, think when Ruben was different. talking about like the customization of bore diameter and forcing cones, um, if you get into like, especially like high end clays guns, um, you'll find regional favorites, like regional gunsmith favorites. And so Bob, the builder of Kriegoff, Kohler, and Browning shotguns may do something different than Bill, the builder of Remington, uh, Winchester, and um, Caesar Greenies. You know, yep. they might have a different tip mm-hmm. or technique, and, it, and maybe the result's the same, or at least the end goal is. But um, uh, now are you talking, like, lo- amongst production guns? Uh, both, actually. Right. <clears throat> um I think for the most part, I've seen consistency with the major manufacturers. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I I can take for granted that if I pick up a Benelli M2, a Super Black Eagle, any high rib Benelli, it's going to print high. They all do. Um, it's in their nature. It's in their build. Um, that's not a problem. It, right. It's just the way they are. Um, and if I pick up a low rib Beretta, it's going to have probably closer to a 50-50 pattern. So 50% above, 50% below, yep. whereas the Benelli is probably closer to 60-40, even 80-20, 70-30. You, you go to a Clay's Club, there's a big steel patterning board there. Yep. Right, So before you get started for the day, you just check your pattern. Find out where you're at. Interesting. Um, yeah. You know, earlier you were, you were mentioning expensive shot and cheap shot. So that's, you know, shells yeah. that you look at when you're going through the aisle or whatever at the store. And that's one thing. What goes... I guess what goes into a more expensive shell sure. versus so, a less expensive shell, all else similar, same shot size, same length. Shot shells are like uh, innately more complicated than rifle shells in my mind. Um, like when really? I talk about <laughs> loading a rifle cartridge versus a shotgun, there's more to a shotgun cartridge than there is a rifle. So okay. <clears throat> with the rifle, we have cartridge case, primer, propellant, projectile. Yeah, that's and it. there's only one projectile. Yeah. With a <laughs> shotgun, we have cartridge case, primer, propellant, wad, underwad, possibly, possibly overwad, shot buffer, yep. cork, shot. Sometimes a cork. And then crimp. So right. is it a roll crimp? Is it a star crimp? If it's a roll crimp, what do we have for an overshot wad? Do we have a cork, like Ruben said? Are we using cardboard? Are we using plastic? There's a lot that goes into the assembly of that shell. And if you were to go buy a box of very budget steel shot, and I, I think this is probably more prevalent with the steel shot for like duck hunting. Yeah. You go buy that $10 box of blue box federal that Ruben said, and then go buy a box of $50 environmental. And you look at even the whole construction. So the, the outside most you know visible thing. And we look at the crimp on the end of the shot. Uh, on the less expensive um, shot, because they're produced in higher numbers, yep. and um, you're going to notice that that crimp might have a bit of a, a, a head to it. It's not like a, a nice uniform taper with a, a yep. good shoulder transition. There might be a little, I don't know, bulging at the end. If you look at the the crimped portion itself, like where the, the star ends fold together, maybe they're not completely uniform. Maybe there's a small split there or a hole. Um, if they use like a sealant on there, whether it's a wax or whether it's a plastic, and some of it seems to be like a hot glue, um, a hot melt or something like that, maybe that's not consistent. As you look at the hole itself, uh, whether the hole is ribbed, whether the hole is smooth, and, and then the thickness of the hole. So like very expensive shot shells, often as you run your fingers along the hole, you'll not feel any BBs. You'll not feel any protrusion through the shape of the hole. You'll feel mm-hmm. just hull, heavy hull. Um, a lot of times the more expensive ones are ribbed or they're, if they're not ribbed, they're just a very heavy plastic. Um, and, you know, more premium shells are going to be more uniform. When we get down to the, the head of the case... Um, like the brass part, The right? brass part, which, like Ruben said earlier, is actually usually steel. Uh, oh, that's why you can pick them up with a Brass-plated steel, yeah. electroplated. Oh, yeah, that makes sense now, yeah. Um, 
better production will have just a better finish on it. You look at it, it's not thin. It doesn't look like it's blotchy. Um, and then the transition between that case head and the hull is very defined, sharp, you know, really nice stuff. It even has kind of a taper to it or like a, you know, when we were reloading and we were chamfering the mouths, yeah, they'll have yeah. a chamfer there too. Hmm. Because that little hook or that edge can catch as we're chambering. Well, yeah, you would think it yeah. might, yeah. Um, so I run a, the the dissident shotgun for uh, most of the shotgun stuff with or three gun, whatever. Um, Semi-auto, yep. AK looking thing. Yep, know, the Malot, fed. Malot, Vepper. And even with that shotgun being worked over, being completely customized and everything, um, I still case gauge all of my shells. EGW uh, makes an awesome shotgun, 12 gauge, 20 gauge case gauge. And so with that gun, typically I run, um, we won't go into names, but I run a, an expensive shot shell. Um, if you were going to go shoot clays and you just wanted to go buy the cheapest stuff, you could probably get it for like five fifty a box. The stuff that I shoot is usually around $9 a box, so gotcha. almost twice as much, right? Okay. My rate uh, of rejection from buying a case of shot, so hasn't been taken out at the store and dropped on the floor and stuff like that, so it's like as pure as, of a form as shot shells as I can buy, um, typically two to three shells per box I won't put in the shotgun. Interesting. And that's on a nine dollar box of, for twenty five shot shells. So, oh. so think about now. Um, <clears throat> I've done the same thing, case gauging the five dollar box of shot shells, and I'd be confident to say that four to five of those won't go in oh, wow. most shotgun chambers. So, think about now the malfunctions you have with a shotgun, the failure to eject or failure to feed or just a jam. Right? Uh, you could you can look at a box. Um, of cheap shotgun shells and 20% of them won't work. And that's now with your particular firearm, right? I mean, that's more of a tuned race gun, right? It so is it's probably a little bit more. Picky. It is, but I, but, but the, the case gauge is a gauge of a 12 gauge chamber. So it, that, it doesn't it, in matter. Theory, just, yeah. I mean like this is what I'm saying is that the differentiation from the dimension of a chamber to what comes out of the box is still important for your right. super X two or your Benelli M two. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it might not be as finicky, but there's a lot of things that happen with shotguns where guys are like, "Oh, I was duck hunting and the thing jammed on the second shot." You know, well, mine hasn't ever jammed. It's like it might not necessarily be that your gun is better. It might right. be that you bought a shell yeah. with a better a better hull or more consistent crimp yeah. or whatever. Hmm. Well, you know, and then also affecting. Uh, the cost of a, of a box of shells is the shot material itself, right? Oh, like we've tremendous. talked about lead, steel, tungsten, heavy shot. Yep. Um, you know, and, and I know for myself personally, like I love to shoot. Well, heck, Ryan, we were just talking the other day. I've got, because I, I bought a ton of them back in the day, basically stole them, uh, was the original uh, Remington yeah. heavy shot, the... The Green Glories, uh, they're awesome, and I, I use them very, very sparingly. Uh, I find that they actually um, make me aim uh, very efficiently. But well, you go from like $0.50 cents a pull to $3 a pull. So. Duplex. <laughs> duplex, that's what those are oh, called. Oh, Remington Duplex. Yep. Loads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's for, t- for turkeys is, yeah, what, yeah. is what I use those, yeah. use those for. But, and, you know, then, yeah, steel, lead, I mean, maybe go into kind of like it's the as you tear up in cost yeah. there. And for people listening to like thinking, well, does that mean I have to buy non-toxic shot? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, in the waterfowling podcast, I talked about when I got into non-tox. Um, it's because I used to buy two cases of steel shot for the representative species that I was hunting a year. So two cases for ducks, two cases for geese. And <clears throat> when I switched to non-tox, like my cripples dropped significantly. I had dead birds when they hit the water. Maybe it was I was a better wing shooter. Um, I know for sure that you will find less pellets in your dead birds when you're shooting non-toxic because they have better penetration. They have better retained energy. I so know, it's actually passing through and leaving yeah. the bird. Yep. But I thought the toxic okay. one was lead and therefore denser, so therefore wouldn't it be having better... Well, we can't we can't shoot lead at ducks anymore. Well, right. Yeah. You were saying that when you switched to non-tox, I, you had... I, by non-tox again, from I, steel to, yeah, to, to more quote, expensive. non-tox, bimetal blend stuff. Oh, yeah. my bad. Tungsten, okay. bismuth, Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Um, it's better. It is. It's certainly better. Is it... Do you have to do it? I don't think so. I think that there are more 
you know, ducks and geese killed with inexpensive steel shot every year than there are with more premium, uh, you know, yeah. versions. But um, when I looked, like, like Ruben did a cost analysis on, you know, low cost trap loads, low cost relatively, $10 a box when you're shooting 200 rounds a day is expensive, um, especially if you're doing it all year. He looked at like a failure point at the gun level and ammunition level and identified that the more premium version is a better way to go. I looked at it from, I'm going to recover more game. I have less follow-up shots. I have right. dead birds. Um, and it definitely was apparent when I switched to a bimetal product, like, right. like heavy shot. Or yeah. I, I did the same thing when, um, you know, probably going back eight to 10 years, um, doing a lot of waterfowl hunting in the Dakotas and Western Minnesota and stuff like that, like hunting 20 to 30 days a year, I noticed a, a big trend going to, um, when they came out, when, um, Heavy Shot came out with Heavy Steel. Yeah. Um, or when Remington came out with Hypersonic, yep. um, which was just a higher velocity steel. But like going to a higher quality shell and especially going to a non tox, I noticed it might have been that I took more time aiming. Uh, it might have been that I took more time um, just making smarter shots because it's $3 a shot or $2 a shot versus, you know, 50 cents a shot. Um, but I, you would you would definitely see more birds that you aimed, that you pointed the shotgun at would go down, and when they hit the water or hit the ground, they were dead and not uh, not crippled, you know. Yeah. That, hmm. that That's for sure that right. happens. So it's like, you know, when you're looking at the box, it's like, holy, holy mackerel, but, you know, quite quite possibly your, your cost per shot is going up, but you're shooting a lot less. Yeah, yeah, and you're recovering more birds. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, what's more important? You getting out for a day duck hunting and losing three, four out of your bag and, you know, looking at your per, per bird cost per shell or is, is like recovering ducks. I, well, and it like, was, it's like anything, right? Is yeah. the most, is the most expensive thing about going on a hunt, your ammo? Right. Like, no, it's the hotel. It's, it's the, the gas. $400 wait or somewhere. Yeah. It's yeah. a, it's yeah. a $1,300 shotgun. Like, yeah, right. I'm going to spend a little more on those things that are yeah. expendables. And, and it, and they do work too. And like with turkeys, with turkeys, especially as we enter this season, having spent more money than any one person should ever spend on turkey loads, if if you if you have a question on turkey loads, please call us. Because I spent so much time and money on that. L lead turkey loads are great; they account for hundreds and thousands of, of birds a year. The non-toxic bimetal blends are better. They pattern better. They kill birds better. There's no question. Um, it, it might be worth. Picking some up, trying I, them in your I, gun. I would agree with that. Yeah. And I've killed a lot of birds with lead. Yep. You know, good old lead. good old fashioned Winchester double X. Turkey loads. That's a good one. Back in the day. That's a good one. Number fours, number fives. Fantastic. I was a five guy yep. with those. I still am a five guy. A five guy too. Still with, stuck. with the heavy shots, I go sixes, man. And I've rolled some birds at distance. And they they do. They kill better, period. Can you can you go back into now we talked a lot about the uh a lot of the different numbers we touched on at the beginning briefly the length yeah length is just getting more, more pellets. just more pellets yeah no more pellets. i mean just it's like uh it's like 30 at six versus 308 right i mean why well, would you just want more no the same it's a little different when it comes to shot shell so this, it's this is this is my initial opinion why oh, would you just want more right you know what i mean most people do because in america we like big jacked up trucks with knobby tires that's what i'm saying yeah mm -hmm. Um, it's actually, I remember my, my good this buddy, is the people's question, my good buddy, Lance Schellenbarger, if Lance is listening, Lance and I shot sporting clays for a long time together. He shot sporting clays with a 16 gauge and, and gave me a very compelling reason why he was a very avid shotgun loader. He would be what I would consider an amateur ballistician on the shotgun level, which is kind of rare. Interesting. Most, yeah. Yes. And Lance probably spent more time loading and shooting shotgun shells over a chronograph and at a patterning board than any 10 people I've ever met put together. Hmm. Um, and he selected 16 gauge intentionally because it threw better, denser patterns. Um, and as he explained it to me, and it makes sense, the ideal shotgun shell has a shot column or the, the, the height, if you were to put a shotgun shell on its, on its head, which is interesting because it's actually kind of like a butt. Yeah. yeah. Stand it upright. Feet. 
the column, how long that shot pile is. Ideally, it is as tall as it is wide. Okay. Yeah. And so that makes it not that tall then. No, not really. Okay. Um, the the, the close as close as you can get to that proportion being even, you will throw a better pattern. And in testing 20, 12, and 16 gauge, Lance settled on 16 gauge. He said it is the perfect gauge because it is it has a more square shot column than a 12. 410 would be the farthest away. <laughs> Correct. Long, <laughs> skinny. Yeah, very. Right. So if we were, like, that's just a fun fact, but let's just go to the 12 gauge. And we're to look at, <laughs> excuse me, um, two and three quarter inch, three inch, or three and a half inch. Yeah. The common loading lengths. And we were to have them all in number fives, all in turkey loads, and we were to pattern them. We look at a pattern two-dimensionally on paper, mm -hmm. right? Yes. We see holes in paper. A three and a half is going to have unquestionably more pellets in it because it's longer. More, more holes, yeah. You see more holes. But you're, oh, you're only seeing two parts of the, the dimension required here. The three and a half inch will have a notably longer shot column. So your pattern is not coming out as a ball or a block. It's coming out as a noodle or a cylinder. Okay. And longer is not better necessarily. Um, there's some great arguments to be had over this. And, and if, if somebody hears a, a you know, shotgun ballistician and you're paid to do it, I'd love to hear it. The longer your shot column is, the more sporadic technically it is, right? So if we're taking 300 pellets and we're stretching them out over four feet, or we're taking 250 pellets and we're keeping them within eight inches. And this is a huge exaggeration just for illustrations. Point. Okay, yeah. What pattern is denser? If we're, if we're measuring it with height and length, obviously the shorter shot column is going to be denser mm -hmm. than the longer one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, as we begin yeah. to shoot a target like a turkey's head yeah. and the first BBs arrive, right. they, they're arriving with lower density and with, with less at one time. But have created contact. Yes. Um, then the shot ball that's coming, the shorter pattern. Yeah. And so I settled on two and three quarter inch turkey loads. They patterned best uh, out of my gun because I believe they had a shorter shot column uh, and you get more pellets on target at one time than you do with a longer shot column. What I don't understand about that is that the the um, diameter of the barrel that they're traveling down is the same. Mm -hmm. So technically, at the very instant that it it impacts your intended target, wouldn't the shot density actually be the same? Because if you're talking about a cylinder traveling down, almost uh, uh, for lack of for like simplification purposes, traveling down the length of that cylinder shouldn't make a difference in the diameter of the cylinder at which... No, but we're trying to, like, look at individual pellets within that area. Yeah, okay. So if... Does that make sense now? No. Oh. So if we stretch our <laughs> shot column, we have the same diameter. Yeah, you stretched it, yeah. Yeah, but we're... No, but, but it, there's more pellets there. There's more pellets in a three and a half for yeah. two and three quarters, yep. right? Over length. Over, over length. Yeah, over length. But it's still the same diameter. Theoretically. So you just have, like it would be, to me, it would seem less dense if there was the same amount of pellets, but they were spread out over length, right? Yes, it would be less dense. It would be less dense. But isn't it just the same exact density as if... I suppose, if okay, now it, I see what you're saying. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Your shot column being shorter, though, you're having all of the payload of that shot column delivered in a shorter amount of time. In a shorter amount of time. So, right. yeah, I okay, I get what you're saying. Then, because, like, in theory, with a longer shot column, it was it's going to take longer for the full amount. Right. For the full payload to get there. But then at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so, all right, two and three quarters, that's like three quarters of an inch shorter, obviously, than three and a half, right? So the three quarters of an inch longer of the three and a half, let's say if you if you take that out, I'm still, I'm still feeling like you still might get, in the amount of time it takes the full two and three quarters to make it and hit the target, all of it, make it and hit the target. Two and three quarters worth of the three and a half maybe has hit it at the exact same time. And it's just that there's an extra three quarters worth of shot shells that are still coming. Yeah. The question is then, is it a waste of shot shells or is it an insurance policy? Or pellet, excuse me, or is it an insurance policy? Okay. Yeah. Right. So I think where three and a half inch comes in handy is pass shooting. Where we have a long shot column, we have a, we have more opportunity for a target to fly into. Yeah. So, okay. so it's kind of what I was going to mention is just that what I've noticed is like, in waterfowl hunting, 
a bigger payload isn't always better, but it can be better. And typically it's because that shot column is longer. So we're looking to hit something that's flying this way. And if we have a shorter shot column, I've found that my my likelihood of knocking a bird out that's not landing, not coming into my deeks. Full crosser. Yeah, full yeah. cross, right? Like I've got a bigger window Large for that bird. Of yeah, right. With so, a longer shot column. Yeah, and so it's not, I've never, and I'll say this, I've never shot three and a halves and got and been cleaning a bird and been like, wow, this is, there's way too many BBs in here. Like I've never found that I've hit the mm-hmm. bird with hmm. more BBs. Okay. Could it be? Yeah. Yeah. This is again on passing birds or snow goose hunting where you're going up into a big group um, okay. and there's a bag limit of 50 a day. Like I'm not super worried about yeah. throwing too many extra BBs, but I have, I've never found like, wow, there was that bird was destroyed. I've just found that it was, I have had better luck hitting crossing birds. Okay. One thing I would suppose maybe is that if you have a longer shot come three and a half or whatever, right. And you shoot recoil and whatever, maybe it has more time to be influenced as well by you moving the gun or the barrel. So you may be sending some off into Timbuktu. Similar theories that I've heard is that longer shot column as (laughs) <laughs> excuse me, you go through the recoil or like the ignition sequence of the shell, having that much more column in there to get disruptive is or disrupted is where we start to see yeah. issues on the patterning board. And like Ruben yeah. was talking about earlier with forcing cones, back boring, choke, we try to eliminate all these variables. Well, now we have this very long shot column. We have a higher uh, chance of, of instability in that column. Oh, I believe that. Yeah. No I, doubt. I also... I don't care who you are. I can't shoot three and a half inch shells as I flinch a lot more. Yeah. They're rather They're pretty punishing. Like they. Yeah. They can be really punishing. Because it's just a lot of, it takes more force to Especially move a Especially with shot an column, inertia gun. Right. And it, if, I think it's a pretty big tell. If you look at, um, there's a sanctioned shoot, <laughs> excuse me, called turkey shooting or card shooting. They're synonymous. Mm-hmm. In which they have these very specialized shotguns that shoot very specialized loads. And the idea is, uh, like, you take, like, a playing card. It's actually, I think, slightly larger than a playing card. And it's the most pellets on that card at, I think, 25 yards or 30 yards. Mm -hmm. They all shoot two and three quarter inch. And they all shoot eights or nines um, or tens. Hmm. Um, And, again, this comes down to pattern density and length. If there was an inherent advantage to shooting something I would have assumed they would have gone to say a three inch yeah. or three and a half. And maybe it's sanctioning things like this. Interestingly, uh, yeah. these guys also shoot uh, straight rifled shot gun barrels. So the barrels have, instead of twisted rifling, they have straight rifling. That is interesting. Wad stopper. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't arguing just for the sake of being argument. Well, actually, maybe I was. Yeah, I was just very curious. Let's go to the Clay's range and settle this. Well, you shoot fine. three and a half should, inch. We should, I am <laughs> terrible. I, but, we should but talk about end, DRAM. In the end, DRAM equivalent. I actually probably would still opt for like two and three quarters for a lot of the reasons. Yeah. They don't, but I was just curious, more or less. Yeah. What is DRAM? The British measurement of volume and weight. Volume two weight goes back to the black powder days when we didn't measure things black powder in, in weight we measured it by volume, volume. so a dram um, which you you can pick up a lot of shotgun shells you see like a three and a quarter inch dram equivalent right? yeah so the numbers you see on the box are yeah. going to be the, the gauge yeah and then the length yeah so twelve gauge two and three quarter inch the shot size usually or the dram yeah. equivalent right yep and then it'll either be dram equivalent and then shot size or shot size and then dram equivalent. It's and usually four things you see on the shell. And the dram and velocity equivalent inputs. is, I believe, the the weighted measurement of powder converted to dram to represent a volumetric charge. Because of Got modern it. propellants. So they say like two and three quarter dram equivalent, which I suppose they could say, you know, 27.5 grains of blue dot, but they say... They don't want to give the recipe away. No. So they, <laughs> so they list this... Make it harder. This dram equivalent yeah, um, to represent the amount of powder relative to the... Or, or excuse me... Um, yeah, relative to the yeah. weight, yep. which is drams. Very bizarre. So in shotgun loading, you have to balance your powder charge versus <laughs> your shot charge weight. And then if you're loading, if you're hand loading, you have to know 
if you need to use a high brass shell or a low brass shell. So, ver- you know, based on what type of shot you're loading. It's very bizarre. It's like we weird. talked about it, it's this way is harder than rifles. This is why I don't load shots. Yeah. I don't yeah. Want- some some people I have requested that. that we do uh, some kind of episode or pod venture oh, on loading man. shot shells. I have a Mac 600 Junior. I was going to say, I've got a 600 Junior. <laughs> I, I don't want to bring it in because I it's so much goofing around. We the, may. the only stuff that I have left is um, from when I was reloading my own steel shot. Yeah. There yeah. was a, a, a awesome, awesome uh, load that it was for steel shot in a two and three quarter inch double A. Yep. Hull mm. uh, with about an ounce of shot. Yeah. I'm not going to say the exact thing, but high score 800X. No kidding. And it I was about 1,940 means. some feet per second with steel shot. You can only load that hull one time, probably. No. Mm. Oh, really? I, I never had any problems with it, but um, it was before uh, shotgun manufacturers could exceed 1,500 feet per second. Uh-huh. So that's how. Oh okay. But, yeah. We we gotcha. may just have to Top reload. Killers. We may just have to reload some, you know, do it for the people. Man, some right? goofing. They had uh, the, the, the was it because it could go through armor they would call like the steel shot being higher velocity it was cuz like they called it a cop killer, right? I don't know. Oof. Ooh. Yeah. That's dark. Cuz it could go through ballistic armor. No. That's dark. Yeah. Uh can I ask how quick of a topic with us being over an hour i'm just curious are slugs are slugs just oh, as complicated man. or slugs are the most ruben and i did the most slug testing of anybody that we, didn't you right? guys almost oh like my dislocate your two, eye from 271 your eye slugs in an hour and 40 minutes didn't didn't your didn't your retina almost peel off or something we times. both had a really bad migraines for yeah. a while and then like i had some issues with my shoulders and stuff but slugs are goofy they're just big giant slabs of metal. Yep. Right? Yep. Are they um, not are they like are there tox non tox versions yeah. of those too? Oh yeah. Definitely. And you're using them to shoot at like deer. Deer. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. in competition sometimes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um I think primarily hunting. Yeah. You know, and a lot of it comes from uh places that don't have rifles or places that didn't have rifles. I've got uh an old sixteen gauge shotgun that came from a family kind of family heritage thing from Sweden. And it's a 32-inch, 16-gauge smoothbore with rifle sights on a mm. rolling block action. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, digging into the history of it, they did that because they would they were allowed one gun. They were allowed to have one firearm in the household. Okay. Their ah. household. So wow. could, they had a uh, 16-gauge for slugs because it was a smaller projectile and a little bit faster and flatter than a, shooting a 12-gauge. Okay. And, and then um, birdshot, obviously. Can you... So... Which speaks to, you know, when we talk about the versatility of a shotgun, that's mm-hmm. what they picked. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. You, you can have one. That's what they picked. Aren't some slugs rifled and then some slugs smooth, but you shoot out of a rifled yeah, barrel? Yeah. So that's a, my a right? super <laughs> funny. Um, rifled slugs do not spin like a, a slug fired through a rifled bore. Right. Very different, huh? Yeah. So Unless you shoot them through a rifle. Um, yeah, correct. Unless you shoot them through a rifle bore. Wait, you can shoot a rifled slug through a rifle oh, yeah. bore? No sweat. Sometimes oh, they man. shoot way better than the most expensive slugs out there. Interesting. So yeah. you typically are going to have what's called a rifled slug, which has grooves on cut into the actual projectile. Mm-hmm. Or you're going to have a sabot if you're from Minnesota, sabo if you're from anywhere else. Um, that gets <laughs> shot. It's a smaller <laughs> diameter than the actual bore, but it's shot in a plastic sleeve or a sub, uh, a sabot type of wad that encases it, which then is shot through a rifled bore. In that. Oh, and that. Uh, oh, oh. The uh, idea like Luke was talking about obturation. It yeah. obturates yep. right into the yeah. Yep. So, so the uh, good recall, Jim. Yeah. I just I can't forget that word. He said it a couple times, and I remember thinking, "What I in like the it. hell is he talking about?" Slugs. <laughs> I looked it up later. <laughs> slugs are, uh, yeah, slugs are. Uh, that's a disaster in itself. They're so. Ex- <laughs> <laughs> they're probably the most expensive, commercially available cartridge, like unit, like cost per, per unit. unit. Yeah, it costs I mean, about it, as much as shooting fifty cal. Do we need to break this Ooh. out into a separate yeah. thing? Yeah, 25 bucks for... We may. Yeah, dude, 20, five. $20 for five is not out Ooh. of the, Yeah, no question, no doubt, like or more. Wow. Some of them out there, yeah. And and there's like slug-specific guns. Like I've got a Browning A-Bolt 12-gauge, so it looks like a rifle. Oh, yeah, bolt action. Savage, Savage yeah. 212s and 220s. And it shoots like a rifle. Like at 100 yards, it shoots about one-inch groups. Um, 
but the slugs are very <laughs> finicky. Just make a giant donut hole size, hole, like hole in the paper. Yeah, right. A lot of times you don't see faster is better. Yeah. Um, we shot some slugs that were two thousand feet per second, crazy, like you know the high performance, and then we shot Hornady custom lights that were like four hundred feet per second slower, yep. but shot phenomenally compared to the the slugs that were way faster. Um, And then you've got slugs that are made for straight up, like, performance on game, and then you've got ones that are made to just burn, you know. Every time I think about how many you shot, I still, like, something about my right eye feels like it's becoming detached. We we talked to Seth and Jaden from Hornady after we did that, and we were like, hey, did you guys see this kind of, you know, thing? Like, because we caught a pretty cool video of a slug, like, basically going like this yeah. through the air like kind of uh, like cork fire screw, cork screw yeah, yeah we, we through saw, the air and yeah. and and like um we're like we've never shot on high speed you know cameras like is this something that is always happening past these you know it was it was beyond what you would use that slug for so it wasn't okay. applicable to the distance but gotcha they were like, well, you know, it's kind of hard to see that unless you really shoot a lot of them and we were like I mean 271 we we're like well we shot like three cases of them and they're like <laughs> Well, well, how many people were there? Because we you know we're limited to to twenty a day here at work. <laughs> <laughs> I was Good like, no, like yeah. my eyes twitching. Like, oh. what's left of it? Yeah, right. Seriously? No, they say they see d- detached retina can happen. Yeah. I, I don't think that's what happened. I mean, we did okay. We're fine. Yeah, everything's yeah. fine. I got the, the Lasix. I'm good. Still, <laughs> put totally good. Stringing together. The gun. The senses. gun broke afterwards. Uh, it was. <laughs> oh yeah, the gun. The handguard <laughs> melted off the shotgun. Yeah. But uh, we did. We did some good recoil testing. It was good learning. Um, slugs. Yes. Found that crossfire too. Is freaking durable scope, man. Hell yeah. If we do That's a, right. I remember that the crossfire pod, two test. A podcast on slugs. Um, <laughs> They're kind of fading from, from existence. They're they're falling into obscurity. Well, really even quick. at least from a hunting standpoint, I think you know there were were portions of Wisconsin where yep. you couldn't use center fire rifles, and now yep. you can. So it's yeah, kind of kind of like the old muzzleloader scope. Yeah, I yeah, see. a little bit. I mean, remini- a little bit. Reminiscing on. I don't know what all states have had like such a big slug heritage, but where we grew up, at least where I hunted. So Ryan went up into the Northwoods where you could only see a you know. 50 yards, and they could use rifles. <laughs> which is which, the, oh, it makes a lot of sense. But I hunted out in western Minnesota and southeastern Minnesota, and you can see 25 miles, and they're like, oh, no, you better use slugs, <laughs> just in case right. you lob one at that tractor that might come by here in two months. Right. Yeah. Which so, I've heard. But I've heard um, <laughs> it's A lot of it does have to do with either population density of of the game, right? So versus i think what a lot of people say is like oh it's how close you are like to a safety city, right it, no yeah. i think most of it has to do with they don't want to have a lottery system for deer hunting they want everybody to go but just not as be as lethal gotcha yeah, yeah. gotcha i've heard more from, challenge i've heard a argument against the safety standpoint that a slug is more likely to skip when it hits the ground I oh yeah they do they bounce it's beautiful. So they which, carry a which lot seems of like torpedo, right? if like you if you if you're minding, you know, your 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 principles of firearm safety and you've shot into a suitable backstop, I would if that is then true, then I would take the center fire rifle because it's going to dematerialize s- and stop. Well, I at mean that like point. we've all I don't know, but like I've seen it where it's like, "Oh, today we're going to go do a deer drive with the so and so's down the road and like you get in a group of people that aren't Mining as good with the the firearm safety, and you see like a lot of whiz bang. You see a deer just running across a field, and then you see these like puffs of dirt, like (laughs) (laughs) like lines of them hitting across the field, and And, it's like and the occasional. Yeah, I was just gonna say somebody about uh yeah. Yeah, I don't think it's to me the amount like just with having the experience doing the slug hunting thing. To me, the amount that you have to shoot because either the inaccuracy or the decreased range or just the decreased velocity. Slug hunting is not nearly as safe as shooting with no, a more precise firearm. I agree. I would, I, I the would volume, rather be, man. I would rather be in a woods full of folks uh, with high power center fires than a bunch of Dude, shotguns firing news. slugs. That's good so, to know. Yeah. 
Interesting. Things. Yeah, but yeah, still st- like Iowa. I think there's a lot of you know. Yeah, slow, but slow. center, you know, straight wall center fires have taken over yeah, like a lot of that. Legend, right. Or fifty, 50 Bushmaster. Bush. Yeah. yeah. Or even like where we're from. I mean, people are going to AR pistols. Yeah. You can shoot a yeah. pistol in slug zone. Right. And it's like okay, it's six five Creedmoor, twelve and a half inch barrel. Good. It's a great option. Pistol brace, whatever. Beauty. I like it. I like it too. And uh, so there, hopefully, for those of you out there who have heard plenty of people, us included, talking about why the shotgun is basically the ultimate do-all gun, but, you know, maybe you're a little bit confused about all the uh, shell selection out there. Hopefully this helped you out. Like Ryan said earlier, if there is still any confusion at all, uh, hit us up. I don't know. I mean, there's lots of people you can talk to. I think we talk to the guys at Hornady and all all other kinds of ammunition companies all the time. Hit them up, too. But, uh, yeah, don't let it intimidate you. And uh, Ruben, Ruben, Ruben I, got, I got kind of a last call, but send it. I know we're not like we're we're not guests really, but the the well, thing that I would say still are we like to treat you as guests. You got water, didn't you? I mean, that's all <laughs> I know, but kind of more of a no regular. Bread, but. Like all right, it's decaf. Um, like Ryan was talking, the the non talk stuff, it's better. It is like for waterfowl hunting, it's better. You're gonna kill more birds, but do yourself a favor. When you're getting ready to go out hunting, don't shoot sporting clays and trap and skeet all year with your $5 a box lead and then go out and hunt with the expensive stuff because you're going to be completely, or even the oh, guys yeah, who yeah. go out to the, you know, go out to the field before pheasant hunt and throw a bunch of clays and they shoot their cheap shells. Like figure out where those, like gotcha. at least on a flying target, like yeah. if you're waterfowl hunting or pheasant hunting or something, you like go shoot around the sporting clays with your your hunting load. Your leads are totally different. It's, it's completely different game. Yeah. That's a great tip. Well, it's like don't go to the Vortex Extreme with, you know, different highest ammo. end match yeah. ammo when you've been practicing with white box all yeah. year. That yeah. was something yeah. that I learned shooting shooting uh, Sporting Clays League uh, at Rice Creek up in Little Falls, Minnesota when I was a kid. Um, use at least before you go hunting at least practice a couple times with the stuff. Right. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Huge game changer for hunters. I like it's a it. fantastic last call. Get your shotgun fit to you. Yeah. You'll save a lot of money in ammo. That's another good one. Yeah. Buy you, a shotgun. Buy a shotgun. That is a good one, Mark. <laughs> if you've <laughs> ever wondered, <laughs> if you've ever driven past a gunsmith. <laughs> Wise words. <laughs> if you've ever driven past a gunsmith and thought, hmm, I wonder what gunsmiths do all day. A lot of them fit shotguns to people. Okay. A lot of it's shotgun okay. work. And, and it's not as expensive as you think. Okay. Cool. A couple hundred bucks, you're going to get everything you need done to get that shotgun running for your body type. Awesome. That, that was an information-dense last I know. five minutes Really, there. I like that. Tied hopefully, a bow on it. Hopefully you listen to that last five minutes. You didn't, you didn't duck out or anything on that. We're going to make sure of it. We're going to do some kind of post that says if you missed that last five minutes, you screwed up. People should know. Messed up. Hey, hey, Ron. People need to know. Okay. All right. Uh, Buy a shotgun. (laughs) And on that note, bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. See you. It's the best last call ever. Buy a shotgun. (laughs) (laughs) All right. That'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation Podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.